Go ahead, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. One of the first Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 9. And I've got a couple of verses that I want to read to kind of lead into what we're, what we're going to say today. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. You can pull it up on the YouVersion Bible app. If you don't have that yet, you should. Download it. It's free. Everybody needs it. And if you have none of those things, I'm pretty sure we'll have it up on the screen behind me as well. Again, start in verse 36. And it says, this is Jesus speaking, or or about Jesus. It says that when he saw the crowds, somebody say crowds, Crowds. he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great. Somebody say the harvest. But the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers out into the field. Jesus, I pray that for the next few minutes that we have together, uh, God, just a fraction of of a moment throughout an entire week, I pray that you would help us today, God, open up our hearts. We don't want hard hearts. We don't want closed hearts, guys. We don't want, God, we don't want, uh, uh, we don't want limitations between what you're trying to speak to us today. And I pray that you will open up our hearts to receive, our ears to hear, our minds to learn what you're trying to teach us today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So that's a good, those are a good couple of verses to highlight if you have, if you have, if you're a highlighter. I always encourage people, if you have a Bible, your Bible is not meant to stay pretty. Your Bible is meant to get marked up, drawn in, written in, underlined, write, take notes. That's what your Bible is for. Um, Any of y'all ever grew up with this? Because I grew up in Virginia. I realized some things were a little bit different over there. But we had a family Bible. Anyone ever have one of those? That was the pretty one. That was the one that, like, you never hardly ever read. You didn't touch. It just looked pretty. And when people came over, you opened up to the middle, it was usually Isaiah. And then you had your own Bible. So uh, we don't have no pretty Bibles. I don't have no family Bible. We just have Bibles, amen? And so if you have it, mark it, write in it, do what you gotta do, uh, because God wants you to devour his word. That's how we grow. So last week, we began to talk about uh, Jesus' people. And, and we started what I guess we can call it a series. I don't really know what it looks like. I just know that, that there is something taking place in our nation right now that is that, that mirrors and is very similar to things that we saw happen in our nation back in the late 60s and the early 70s. And during that particular time, there was a, a movement of people at the exact same time at the kind of the height of the hippie, free love, experimentation movement. There was also a movement of people called the Jesus people who were responding to the brokenness that they saw. And they realized that what they were seeing in their friends and in their family members and their peers and their colleagues was was not working for them. They saw people dying. They saw people getting diseases. They saw people overdosing. They saw people fighting battles that they would never be able to win. And they realized something was missing from the equation. And the thing that was missing was the reality and the presence of Jesus. And so they took it upon themselves to go out and not to, not to try to get people to come in. Sometimes that can be the flaw within, within our church world is where we're consumed with trying to get people to come in. And there, trust me, I'm, I'm a pastor. There's nothing wrong with trying to get people to come into church. But sometimes it's not a field of dreams scenario. It's not build it and they will come. You have to go to where people are. Now here's the cool thing. Everywhere you go, there are people. So sometimes we kind of overcomplicate this whole reality of, of going out. We wait for the church to schedule some event. Well, pastor, if you can just get it on the calendar when the church is going to go out, then I'll try to, try to make it happen. No, it's, it's not about scheduling something. It's about you and I in our daily, regular lives choosing to live as Jesus' people. And Jesus' people are not perfect people. Jesus' people are not religious people. As a matter of fact, it, is no, it could never, couldn't be any further from the truth. We are not about religion because Jesus isn't about religion. Jesus is about relationship. We've said it for the last almost, which by the way, did y'all know that we are in September? Combo Church will hit our, our second birthday. It'll be two. Two years old. Feels like dog years, so it's like 14. No. Now we're excited about that. So y'all can mark your calendar for that. I think it's September 27th, if I'm correct, where we're going we're gonna to party in some way, shape, or form 
on a Sunday. So, but anyway, it's, it's one of those things where we have said from the beginning, God does not want a religion with you. He wants a relationship with you. They are so different because a religion is where you have to follow all these rules and regulations in order to, to kind of like, it's kind of like a kid trying to get their parents' attention who's not paying attention. Jumping up and down, notice me, hey, I'm over here. Hey, I, I did something, aren't you proud of me? Don't you recognize me now? Or it's this, or on, on an extreme other side, religion is, is this whole thing where I am my own God. And therefore, I live for myself and I do what pleases me. God's not in either one of those sectors. God's in the the, the position of relationship where what he's trying to do is he is cutting through all of our brokenness. He's not asking you to fix your brokenness. He's, He's cutting through the brokenness and he's cutting through the sin and he's cutting through the limitations and he's cutting through everything that is a barrier and an obstacle for you and for me And he is the one that is providing the initial means of relationship. For God so loved the world that he gave. And the reason why he gave was so that we wouldn't perish in the sins that we live in and the the punishment that we deserve, but that we would have eternal life with him in relationship with him. All that to say, Jesus' people are not religious people. Can I get an amen? Y'all got to talk to me this morning. Okay. Combo Church, we, we want to be, and this is a journey, by the way, for everybody. You don't, it doesn't matter whether it's, you, you, whether you're here and you're not a Jesus follower and you're not sure if you believe all that stuff yet, or if you're a pastor or if you've been walking with the Lord for years and generations, it all, it's still a journey. It's still a journey of discovering more and more who God is. And Consequently, discovering the more you realize who God is, you realize just how broken you are. And that's not a bad thing because it, it, maturity in your relationship with God actually leads you to more dependence on God. In, in the natural world, it goes backwards, right? Like the more mature we get, the less dependent we are on others. Like I can, I, I, I no longer have anybody who needs to change me, so I'm good now. I'm, and that's, that's a good thing. My wife's very grateful for that. All she will tell me what to wear, but that's different. No, in the kingdom of God, maturity spiritually doesn't mean that you don't need anybody's help. It doesn't mean that you look at God and you're like, hey, I needed your help before, but I got this now. I'm good. Because the moment that we do that is the moment that we end up falling flat on our face, somebody. The moment that what we thought we had conquered ends up becoming the very thing that trips us up. No, dependence on God is fruit of maturity spiritually. And yeah, yeah, you begin to conquer things that used to destroy you, and they don't have a hold on you like they were, but God is not wanting to keep you in the same place where you're safe. He's always looking to take you to a new place. He's always looking to take you deeper in relationship with him. So we got to understand, like, I want our church to know uh, and to continue to grow in what it means to be Jesus' people. And that's why we're talking about this right now. I really believe that right now is a moment in time where what we are seeing in the kingdom of God is God moving passionately and strongly through people who are willing to say yes to him so that we can impact people who are stuck and broken and lost and hurting. So it's a process, right? We gotta, we're gonna continually learn what it means to be Jesus' people. But here's one of the things that was sad in the aftermath of the Jesus people movement. Is that, you know, out of that, there were amazing things that did happen, churches, movements, leaders, uh, all types of things that, that are in place now, that are serving the kingdom of God now, that were birthed out of that, out of that era. But also what happens is it, it, it's, we, we get into a lull when we're past the passion. Some of my favorite people in the world are the ones that before they knew Christ, they were the, the people that you didn't want to know, <laughs> Some of y'all are in here, and you can say amen to that because you're like, yeah, that was me. No, the people who know how much they have been saved from, once they have that revelation of who Jesus is, become some of the most radical, Jesus-following, passionate people that exist. And they are fun to be around. They're fun to go have lunch with because they're the one who's going to talk to anybody about Jesus who's willing to stand there for a half a second so they can start talking. I love it. And unfortunately, the more we get into passion, 
passion in our, in our mental state, in our human nature, breeds maturity. But in a human nature, maturity tells people, hey, hey, shh, 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 shh. calm down. Calm down. I know, I know you're passionate. I know you got zeal. I know you just found out Jesus. But I've known him for a while, so just calm down. Everything is going to be okay. <laughs> you just need to, you know, not everybody's about that now. No, I, that's, that's one of the, that's, that's where, you know, religion has creeped into your spirit. Because there should be something, and I, and I feel convicted talking about this even right now, like in myself. Like there should be something that stays fresh and stays alive inside of us. When we never lose sight of the reality that what Jesus did, and, and we didn't find Jesus, by the way, because it wasn't our search. He came after us. Even though I loved the song back in the day, I found Jesus. It was a great song. And it was like, well, you know, technically, I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. Don't just enjoy the song and worship Jesus, will you? But we didn't find Jesus. Jesus found us. And he didn't, and, I, and probably that's not even accurate because he never lost us. He always knew where we were. He always knew what was happening. And he was in constant pursuit of your heart. Constant pursuit of trying to get you to be in relationship with him. We have to understand when it comes to this context of Jesus, not only is our salvation found in him, but you gotta realize your identity is found in him. Your purpose, your life, your fulfillment is found in Jesus. So many times we get lost trying to get fulfillment in certain aspects of life or relationship or people, and then we always end up getting disappointed at those aspects of life, but the reality is is that that was never supposed to be the thing that fulfilled you. Jesus was not meant to be a supplement for you. He's supposed to be your oxygen. He's supposed to be your everything. He's supposed to be, he's supposed to be the thing that consumes you because I love as you know, the Bible talks about as deep calls out to deep. It paints this picture of you never get to a point in your relationship with God where you get the certificate and you've arrived. Maybe, I think that's heaven, right? I think that's like when we get to that point, Everything, every limitation will be removed and we will, we will see God in a way that, that in our human limitation we would never be able to fully see. But when it comes to this life, when you have one revelation of who God is and it blows your mind, you realize that that's just the beginning of the next step. It's just the beginning of the next step because God's like, okay, you're ready, boom, this is who I am. You're like, oh, that's who you are. He's like, well, that's part of who I am. Are you ready? Boom, this is who I am. And, and God continues to blow your mind with his love and with his grace and with his mercy over your life and with the plans that he has for you and the ways that he wants to bless you. Did you know that God wants to bless you? God does not want you to be wretched. God does not want you to be broken. And you're like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just a dirty sinner. I'm broken. That's just who I am. No, no, it's actually not. There's been really bad theology and really bad teaching in so many ways for so long, telling people that we're stuck in this mindset, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner who's saved by grace. It's you're saved by grace. But the whole thing is that when you are raised to new life in a resurrection power of Christ, Christ was not the same person either, and neither are you. Christ became a glorified version of the Son of God when he rose from the dead, conquering death, conquering hell, conquering the grave. So if Jesus was transformed into new life, what makes you think that you're still the same person that you were when you said yes to Jesus? You're not the same person that you were which means that the things that held you before when you were in sin no longer have authority to hold you anymore. So stop saying, well, man, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not. Unless you don't know Jesus yet, and then you are. But the beauty of that is that you don't have to be. And you don't have to obey all the rules. All right, Jesus people. Some of this is one of the things I love. I'm talking about passionate people that, you know, they get saved and they realize, wow, I was jacked up and now, and, and I didn't deserve this and God loved me. So some of them were only like one day ahead of not dropping acid than the person that they were just talking to. Some of them might have been enhanced because they still were. And they were seeing something in Jesus nobody else was seeing. I don't know. No, that's not, I'm not approving that. I'm just saying that's what they went through back in the day. Now we need to know when it comes to this whole Jesus people thing, it's not a religious thing. It's not a denominational thing. It's not a personal preference thing because what we tend to do is we wanna get passionate about the things in God that come easy to us. 
And we're like, yeah, that's my thing. That's just who I am. And where God's always trying to expand us and to expand our spirit and to broaden our capacity and to take us into realms of following him that lead us into uncomfortable territory. If your goals and your relationship with God keep you comfortable, you have the wrong goals. If you are comfortable currently in your relationship with God and you feel like everything's good, I'm gonna challenge you that you may be deceived in the reality of what you think you need. Because God is always wanting you to operate and exist in a realm where you cannot handle it and you need him for it. Don't ever, and here, here's another one. This, today was not supposed to be a message about uh, Mythbusters from things that we say wrong in the past. But listen, if, I hear it say it all the time. Well, God's never gonna give me anything I can't handle. False. We're like, it's in the scripture. Yes, it is in scripture. It's talking about sexual temptation. It's talking about how in sexual temptation, God will never give you more than you can handle and he will always give you a way out. So don't take something that was in context meant for one specific yet very important item and throw it across your whole life and say, well, things are getting tough, so I don't know what's going on. Pastor, I need prayer because God said he's never going to give me anything that I can't handle. I'm like, no, he's going to give you everything that you can't handle because he wants you reliant on him. And the moment that you stop being reliant on who God is, doesn't mean, it means you're not living in faith. It means you're living in your own strength. And you don't need God to live in your own strength. Jesus' people stepped out of their homes or their buses or whatever. You can, the pictures are great from back in the day. And they stepped out not being confident that they knew everything. They were confident in whose name they were going out in. And they knew, and I love this, even today, like one of the funnest things you can do, maybe the second time is the funnest, the first time there's a stomach situation, is to, is to get up, go somewhere, go down to the, to the plaza in downtown Reno and, and, and just go up to somebody and say, God, I need you to give me a word for somebody. I'm telling you, the first time, there might be a little situation. But after that, it becomes fun because God will come through. Do you know why God's going to come through? Not because he cares whether you're embarrassed or not, because he cares about the person that you're trying to talk to. Jesus' people would incessantly put themselves in awkward situations to go after people who everyone else was staring away from because they knew that if God cared about them and they didn't deserve it, then God also cared about the people they were going to go talk to. And thousands and thousands, even some would say hundreds of thousands of people in that era came to know Christ. Miracles, signs, wonders, baptisms by the thousands. Churches were planted out of that. Leaders came out of that. Uh, the world was literally impacted and turned upside down because people said yes to being Jesus' people. We are Jesus' people, and Jesus' people stay focused on the harvest. That's actually the title of the whatever portion of this message I'm going to get to today. <laughs> Jesus' people stay focused on the harvest. And it's not just the end result, because we think harvest is the end result, right? No, we, the harvest is the process of the entire thing that gets you to the point of a harvest. So a quick story. I'll do this one short, because I want to get into some stuff here. So Kara and I, have, we have a little garden, a yeah, little garden. Y'all have seen it. Some ask if we're not feeding the hungry with this type of situation. But just enough to like, you know, have the fruit of our labor. We got some tomatoes. We, we're trying to grow some peppers. It looks like we're going to get some peppers. It's pretty exciting. We got some berries that are growing. Just, it's fun. And la but we tried last year. Last year was a disaster. It was terrible. I think we got maybe a few, we got a few tomatoes. And it's just like the cherry one. So it's like if you're, if you're, if you're on that show alone, here I go. I'm talking about alone again. It's, it, you got nothing basically. And so after that was over, we're like, okay, we got to do something different next time. And uh, so this is, this is a picture from this year. Don't go to the next one yet, but this is a picture from this year. Because what we did was we went in and we like, we got we to gotta rent a tiller, which you know what a tiller is? You know, it tills up, the, okay, it tills up the dirt. And they're all made for people who are five foot three, by the way. I'm tilling this thing like this. And then it goes lower because it goes down in the dirt anyway. So we're tilling up the dirt. We brought a bunch of, you know, healthy soil to mix in with it. We're pulling out weeds. There's, there's weird debris in there that we were unaware of. What turns out, the, the soil was unhealthy. And when the soil's unhealthy, it won't, it won't produce a harvest. And so this is this year. You know, we, we, we worked out. We actually did the seeds and we did them indoors. And we kind of like, what's that called? Is there a name for that? Like we, 
Greenhouse it, yeah. We green, so we started inside to kind of let them grow from seeds, and then they turned into, and they were looking good. We're like, they were ready to go outside. We put them outside, and then within like two days, we're like, no, they're going to die. This is not, they're not going to make it. But we had to kind of give it attention, didn't we? We had to nurture it. We had to make sure that it was watered. We had to make sure that even in certain times it was covered. We had to take care of this plant so that it would get to the point of having a harvest. Now, if we just put it in the ground, disappeared, and we're like, hey, when everything grows up and there's a harvest and it's going to be fun, give me a call and I'll come and pick it up. That's a lot of how the church treats revival. We're like, hey, as soon as things get exciting, as soon as it gets fun, and as soon as all the people start getting saved, uh, let us know because we want to come and be like, woo! I don't want to do the hard work. I don't want to get on my knees and cry. I don't want to be humble and broken before the Lord, but I don't want to miss the party at the end. So make sure, hit me up. So this was, that's my hand. Wait, there we go. It's my hand. And those were, that was like the first fruit of the harvest. Now, about three weeks later, we're still, you know, you're not done. We're like, we're still nurturing, we're still watering, we're still, we're pulling off dead growth, you know, dead growth. It's thing that's not going to produce anything, so, but it keeps sucking nurt- uh, uh, nutrients, and you got to get rid of it so the nutrients can go to the right places. And so th- this was like three weeks later. Go to the next one. Look at that. Look, I even got convo in there. I even, this was probably ten times what was produced the year before, which I know that's kind of sad, but that's what, it's, it is what it is. So that, and I don't know, there was a lot. I've been munching on They're delicious. They're so good. They're so sweet, these cherry tomatoes. Now, here's the cool thing. Even in the midst of harvest, what's on the vine is still 10 times more than what you've already harvested. And I'm I'm not joking. I'm not trying to be like a farmer preacher right now, but God spoke to me in that moment. And he said, listen, somebody in church today needs to hear this. So someone who's listening to the podcast or watching the video needs to hear this. That listen, you may not be content with what you have harvested yet, But what is on the vine that is still developing is 10 times, 50 times, 100 times more than what you've already seen. Don't give up. Don't give up in the harvest right now. Come on, there is more ahead. God is still moving. He is still working. He is still doing things. Come on, don't give up. Can somebody give God a hand clap this morning because you need to believe that for yourself. Jesus' people stay focused on the harvest. There's a couple of things I feel like, this is a completely agricultural message today, I guess I wasn't planning on that, but it really, it kind of looks like it. There, there are a few things that have to happen in you so that you can stay focused on the harvest because there's a harvest in you and there's also a harvest you will be a part of. The kingdom of God is always dual purpose. It's focused on what God is doing in you, but it's always, 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 100% of the time, simultaneously focused on what's going on around you. If we miss one, we miss the big picture. If we focus on self and ignore others, we miss the big picture. If we focus on others but we're falling apart, we're missing the big picture. So there are things that we have to do to make sure that we stay focused on the harvest. And here's the first one, we gotta cultivate our soil. We have to cultivate our soil. And here's the thing, your soil is your soul. Say that 10 times really fast because that, that's, that's a tongue twister. All right, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 20, it says, and, uh, and, uh, and the seed, this is Jesus speaking, he's telling a parable, and the seed that fell on good soil, somebody say good soil, um, represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. Our soil is our soul. Come on, there are things inside of us that if we don't deal with them properly, it will keep us from being in a place to grow and produce the fruit that God desires to do inside of us. And that's, that's, honestly, that's something that nobody else can do for you. That has to be things, that's a battle that is fought between you and your knees. And you getting before the Lord and saying, God, this is in me and I'm tired of this and it's gotta leave, it's gotta be done. God's gonna help you. God's going to help you, but nobody can do that for you. People can pray with you. People can pray for you. But that will never change your, the desire in your spirit to submit yourself before the Lord. you got to work on your own soil. Now, here's number two, and this is, this is my, I think this is my favorite one right here because it, it kind of paints a big picture. 
Number two, you got to plant kingdom seeds. You got to plant seed. Nothing's going to grow if you don't plant seed, right? Nothing's going to grow. And the cool thing is, is that when a harvest is produced, even inside of like one of those little tomatoes, there are more seeds than was planted to produce that one little tomato. And it is the same way in the kingdom of God. Listen, there will be some things that are harvested that will be to feed you, and there will be things from the harvest that are going to be replanted. And we got to understand that, listen, it may have taken one seed from somebody else to produce all of this or to produce so much, so much more than we can even imagine, but the potential of seed that comes out of what was produced in the harvest will be far greater than anything that we could even wrap our minds around. That's why in Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, God says that he will outdo your wildest dreams. He will go above and beyond anything that you could even dream of, hope for, or imagine. That gives us a little bit of a, of a watermark, doesn't it? All right, well, how should I be dreaming? You should be dreaming and asking God and believing and praying for things that are absolutely ridiculous. That if other people heard you talking about those things, they would want to walk away slowly because they're like, this is just weird. Why are you? That's not, that's impossible. That's impossible. Come on, God is so much bigger. And it's not our job to make God small and manageable. It is our job to respond to the bigness of God and ask for his help to enlarge our spirit. And to give us faith to believe for what he has already said is done. we got to plant kingdom seed. One of the best ways that you can plant kingdom seed is to, is to speak life. Seeds of words are the most powerful seeds in the kingdom of God. Because you may not have the money that somebody has to do certain things. You may not even have the time that other people may have to do certain things. But you have just as many words to speak as anybody else. And when it comes to who you interact with on a daily basis, who you pass in the street, who's checking out your groceries, who's, who you're interacting with at home, you have the opportunity to plant kingdom seeds into their life by what you speak into who they are. Because your words, check this out, the Bible tells us that your words literally carry the power of life and death. You can speak life into someone or something or you can curse it and speak death. You're like, man, I'm not that important. I'm not that powerful. Your words are. Your words are. And you know what? That's part of our nature that God has given us that is unique to our, to humanity. Because that same power that God, he gave it to us is because he had it. That's why God in the beginning and didn't say, and in the beginning, God took 100 billion years to one by one with, with things in his hand, craft stars, and then go where he was going in the galaxy and place one, and then, and then billions of years later, go and place one over here. He was like, I ain't got time for that. I want to get to my people. So this is what I'm going to do. Boom, let there be light. Stars, boom. Just like that. That's my big bang theory. God spoke, things exploded. You're like, oh my gosh, you can't say that in church. It's big bang theory, it's evolution, whatever. It's not. It's not what we're talking about. Come on. God speaks. Things happen. You have purpose because God spoke purpose into you. You have life because God spoke life into you. And we have in our world right now, more than ever, doesn't need Christians to be angsty, angry grouches on social media. They need you to lift your voice, stop being silent, but use your words to speak life. Use your words to prophesy life over our nation, over your family. Your friends don't need you to be more religious. They need you to be more Jesus. Our, our region, Reno, Sparks, this whole region, we don't need more religious. We need more Jesus. Because, yes, Jesus is the answer. Even when we don't know how to break down the answer, we can just say, I know who is the answer. Let me lead you to him, and, and, and by his grace, and I'll be here, by his grace, he's going to be the one that helps us figure this whole thing out. we got to keep planting kingdom seeds. I love this. In, in, in Hebrews 10.25, it says, and let us not neglect our meeting together. I love that right now, because right now there are so many enemies of the kingdom of God who are trying to keep us from gathering together. And I'm not going into a whole thing of, well, the dangers and this. No, I get that. But I'm talking about in a bigger sense, we want, there, there is a fight for the control of fear over the kingdom of God. Amen. And even 1,900 and so years ago, we're told, and not, don't neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. Somebody say encourage. encourage. 
encourage one another, especially when? Now, that the day of his return is drawing near. You're like, well, that was a long time ago, and you still haven't returned yet. That's because he's on God's time, not ours. We should still live with an expectation and an expectancy of his return. Whether we see it in our life or whether it's another thousand years from now, that's not our point. The disciples even tried to ask Jesus that. They're like, hey, um, you know, so you're, you, know, you just rose. You said you were going to do that. You did. That's pretty cool. Um, you're telling us you're getting ready to leave us to go back to the Father. You're going to send us your spirit. So is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus' words to them was like, this is my paraphrase. You can go read it. It's in Acts chapter 1. This is my paraphrase. Jesus says, that's none of your business. Why you can, don't be concerned about that. I've already given you a mission. Go do the mission. Well, Jesus is returning, so things change. No, nothing changes. The only thing that's going to change are those who have lost sight of being Jesus' people. We need to return to who we're supposed to be, live with urgency, live in the times. Yes, we should know the times. Yes, we should see the signs. But it should only maximize and increase our passion for people to know who Jesus is. Because literally at the end of the world, whatever that is, whenever that is, whatever that looks like, the only thing that's going to matter at that point is who knows Christ and who has rejected him. That should be the motivation behind what we focus on, who we are, what we do, and not allow ourselves to get distracted with the peripheral of the things that are trying to get us off target, off message, and off point, but focused on the beauty of who our Savior is and that he has put his life inside of us. We need to plant kingdom seeds. Thank you.